Good evening, friends. Nice to have you with us. Welcome to the Graduate Center. Particularly want to thank you for braving the traffic and the trains, which I gather are more than usually uh, complex this evening. I'm Bill Kelly, the Interim Chancellor of the City University of New York. Tonight's event continues one of the Graduate Center's signature series, Extraordinary Lives. As many of you know, the Graduate Center is a school of arts and sciences, a center for applied and theoretical research, a platform for performance, conversation, public debate. As a community of students and scholars committed to the idea that learning is a public good, we regularly offer programs featuring eminent thinkers, cultural leaders, distinguished writers, performance, performers, and artists. As part of that enterprise, we are really delighted to bring you this evening's conversation with Gay Talese. Certainly for this audience, Mr. Talese needs no introduction, but let me say a few brief words before we begin our conversation. Gay Talese was born in Ocean City, New Jersey, the son of a master tailor. His mother owned a woman's dress shop, where, as Mr. Talese has written, he first learned the art of listening. He has rendered an account of those years with extraordinary grace in Unto the Sons, a book that will be familiar to most of you. His account of his family's immigration to the United States from Italy in the years before the Second World War. He graduated from the University of Alabama in 1956 and talked his way into a copy boy's job at the New York Times, a period of his life documented in the wonderful essay, The Origins of a Nonfiction Writer. 1960, he began to publish in Esquire and became a contract writer for the magazine, that magazine in 1965, producing a series of extremely influential pieces, many of which are collected in the Gate Talese Reader, a volume, again, I'm sure you are familiar with. One of those portraits, Frank Sinatra Has a Cold, was chosen by Esquire as the finest essay it had ever published. But Mr. Talese's magazine pieces and books have been concerned primarily with the lives of far more ordinary people. Beginning with the publication of The Kingdom and the Power, his inside narrative of the New York Times, he turned to longer form nonfiction. He followed that best selling work with Honor Thy Father, Thy Neighbor's Wife, and Unto the Sons, his most recent book, A Writer's Life, which is just fabulous. If you haven't read it, you need to documents the interplay between experience and writing, or as Mr. Talese describes his work, the art of hanging out. We are fortunate indeed that Mr. Talese permits us to hang out with him. He wraps a companionable arm around our shoulder and introduces us to people and places we'd never know and reacquaints us with those we think we do. I know no writer whose curiosity is as insatiable or whose scope is as broad. Across more than 50 years, Mr. Talese has chronicled the human condition in all of its variety and never seems to have been bored or lost faith in people's capacity to surprise. His has been a lover's discourse, and we have been fortunate to be invited along for the ride. Please join me in welcoming Gay Talese to our stage. Thank you. Thank you for... Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for being with us. It's a great pleasure. It's my pleasure. Let, let me begin, if I may, in 1960 uh, <clears throat> with the essay, one of my favorites, New York is a City of Things Unnoticed. And if you'll permit me, I just want to read a, a couple of sentences from that. New York City is a city, I'm sorry, New York is a city of things unnoticed. It is a city with cats sleeping under parked cars, two stone armadillos crawling up St. Patrick's Cathedral, thousands of ants creeping on top of the Empire State Building. The ants probably were carried up there by wind or birds, but nobody is sure. Nobody in New York knows any more about the ants than they do about the panhandler who takes taxis to the Bowery, or the dapper man who picks trash out of the Sixth Avenue trash cans, or the medium in the West 70s who claims I am clair clairvoyant, clairaudient, and clairsensuous. New York is a city for eccentrics and a center for odd bits of information. New Yorkers blink 28 times a minute, but 40 when tense. Most popcorn chewers at Yankee Stadium stop chewing momentarily just before the pitch. Gum chewers on Macy's Escalator stop chew chewing momentarily just before they get off to concentrate on the last step. Coins, paper clips, ballpoint pens, and little girls' pocketbooks 
are found by workmen when they clean the sea lion's pool at the Bronx Zoo. Each day, New Yorkers guzzle 460,000 gallons of beer, swallow 3,500,000 pounds of meat, and pull 21 miles of dental floss through their teeth. <laughs> A groundbreaking work in all <laughs> kinds of ways. Not the kind of writing that one would expect from a young writer f at the Times, which you were at the time, for that matter, not a, even a young writer at the Tribune. What was the genesis of that piece? H what kinds of ambitions as a writer did it, did it signal for you at the time? Well, on the New York Times, which I joined uh, in 1956, at first in the sports department, and later on in 1959, general assignments, which I continued as a general assignment reporter until 65. When I then left for one year to write for Esquire, you made reference to yeah. Sinatra. That's when I did that piece and, and a few others. Then I left the next year, 66. I didn't continue with Esquire because I wanted to go back to the New York Times and write about some of the people I had come to know during those almost 10 years of being in, in the main building, the 229 West 43rd Street, the, the, the New York Times home. And I thought there were so many interesting people, not important people necessarily, not people who would make news, but people who were part of news making or at least part of the miracle of daily journalism yeah. as was exercised between a night and a morning on the New York Times. And those people were really interesting, but they were ordinary. And when I went out of, after my little year with Esquire, doing Sinatra, and then Joe DiMaggio, there were two pieces I did that year. One was on an obituary writer. Oh, yes, that's a good Alden Whitman. It was, my, was my, first, the, my first piece. Mr. Bad News. And my third piece was on the managing editor to the New York Times. In those days, a man named Clifton Daniel, who dressed at least as well as I do. And who was I, I, I had a hard time believing that. And, I, and he had a wife, a famous wife, Mr. Harry Truman's daughter, Margaret. Yeah. And um, I just thought he had something to say that was important, but more important, he had a job that was very important, being the managing editor. And I realized that one day when I was still a reporter, I don't know what gave me such an elevated sense of self to go into his office, but I, had, I, was, I went in the managing editor's office one day as a reporter, and I noticed for the first time in his office, around the walls were pictures of previous managing editors. Going back to a great editor named Carr Van Anda, who was the man who directed the coverage of the Titanic, the New York <laughs> Times had more reporters on that story, as you would imagine, yeah. than any other. And there was editors, managing editors from the World War I period and the World War II period, and the period of the Civil Rights South, a, a managing editor named Cliff, uh, Turner Catledge. Yeah who was from Mississippi when the New York Times was invading Mississippi with its coverage of some of the lynchings and some of the violations of civil rights in that, in that notorious state at the time. And here was the managing editor from that place, whose grandfather had been a founder of the, uh, one of the, whose grandfather was a friend of the founder of the Klan. Nathan Bedford Forrest. Forrest, of course. Was, 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 one of his soldiers was a man named, his last name was Turner yeah. from Mississippi. Turner Catledge, that was the mother's side, yeah. was, and I thought the interesting stories that are in those little photographs yeah. around the Clifton Daniels office, if I could get the stories of those managing editors, I could really write yeah. about the paper that I was so interested in writing about and rather do a book on that subject. That's why I quit Esquire to do that book. It took me four more years. I did it. But I'm getting off what you wanted to know. But what you want to know is about curiosity. Yeah. And so if you look at pictures, you see more than pictures, you see ideas that are unexplored. Yeah. And it, they, or you see, as when I was a boy from a provincial town called Ocean City, you mentioned that. I came to New York uh, looking with a sense of wonder, endless wonder, at what was in front of my eyes. Everywhere you walk in New York, there is, especially if you never been in New York before, because when I first got a job as a copy boy, it was my first yeah. visit to New York as well. You didn't come to New York when you were growing up in Ocean City? No. Philadelphia? The Philadelphia was Paris when I grew up. Yeah. That was the big city, <laughs> you know, but, but not New York. That was too big and too far, 150 miles in those right. days, yeah. unless you liked to ride buses, which I didn't. So I didn't come to New York. 
but I did as a, as a copy boy. And the first, and, and my job as a copy boy, if you'd even know what a copy, now they call it an intern, I guess, but your job was to buy sandwiches, uh, run on errands for the editors yeah. or, or, or reporters, and, um, and also to be a messenger. There was 14 stories. And one of the, uh, probably the best job I ever had in my life in terms of, of writing a book about the New York Times, my job as a copy boy would be to deliver to all the 14 floors of the building uh, cables from abroad. Foreign reporters, correspondents wow. would send stuff by cable and then it would be transmitted through a my Mayograph machine into copies. Yeah. My job was to deliver stories that were sent in from overseas, from some of the Times bureaus, to the uh, Sunday editor on the eighth floor, to the editorial page editor on the 10th floor, yeah. to the classified advertising director on the second floor, yeah. to the, um, uh, to the editor-in-chief uh, and also owner of the Salzburger Fountain on the 14th floor, that was the top floor. And as I'm going up and down the elevator, I'm listening to conversations of, of editors and reporters, I'm getting to know the elevator operator. In those days, they wore white gloves. Yeah. They, were, they were dignified people. Uh, the window washers that I would see here and there, the secretaries of some of these eminent editors. In the, wall, in the background, more photographs, usually paintings of the Salzberger family, Orville Dreyfus, Arthur Hayes Salzberger, Adolf Ox, statues of Adolf Ox, who the great, the great patriarch of the times. Yeah. He died in 1935. But I'm up and down the elevator and seeing the statues and the photographs and meeting people, how they dress, how they speak, at their offices, what they look like. And I'm just seeing people I thought worth writing about. Yeah. But the curiosity, being a, a newly arrived person with a large sense of being an outsider, which is essentially the journalism, I think, to be a little bit removed, being foreign, having a foreign father help me to be removed, particularly as I was born in 1932 in Ocean City and grew up when at Italy in 1942-43 well, was being invaded. And my father, who came from Italy in 1922 uh, and became a citizen in 1928, but was the only member of this family from the deepest part of southern Italy, Calabria it's called, the poorest mountainous area of, of the peninsula of Italy. His father, his brothers, I mean, were fighting in the Italian army two of them uh, in Mussolini's army trying to stall the invasion by allied troops, Canadians, US, British, up from North Africa. And I remember he was reading the New York Times with a great deal of dread every morning because that had the foreign news and he'd be reading about the invasion the of his army village. Come to their village right? So I saw that side of how in a little town we had a, it was a really small town in the wintertime, 5,000 people. In the summertime, being resorted, it's 60,000 people. But we lived in an apartment above the store. We, meaning my mother, who ran the dress shop, my father, the tailor, and I had a young sister, and myself, just four of us. And in the daytime, my uh, quite assimilated and English-speaking parents, they would speak Italian at night, but in the daytime, in this Protestant right-wing city then and this still now. It was originally a Methodist town, was it, it is not? founded by Methodist it's, ministers, and, and the main the, streets were after Wesley and Asbury were yeah, at yeah, yeah. And, and some Irish, were, but not a very large Italian no, population. But they had a small, uh, they had a, a Irish, the, the Catholics, the few there, were, were Irish, and there were a couple of Italians, me and I don't know who else. <laughs> and, um, but what I remember is how a war, an international event as that, had in the daytime from the customers talking about the war, the women that went in my mother's dress shop talking about nylon, you couldn't get nylon stockings, the, 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 the rationing of gas and people who had servicemen within the family or, or uncles working in defense plants in Philadelphia or, or elsewhere. And they'd be talking about the war and since it was a seashore resort and had a boardwalk on the sea there, Atlantic, uh, Atlantic Ocean, at night, the lights were dimmed, painted black on one side, and patrols along the boardwalk at night looking for submarines from Germany or wherever. So we had a sense of, of foreboding, a sense of awareness. But at night- You was an outsider at this point? I mean, what was the I didn't know what I was. I was, I was, I was, I felt I was half an American. Huh? And I also went to movies with my 
his classmates on Saturday when we could go to movies. And there would be the March of Time, War News, and there were the Italians, the dusty old Italians in the army being hoarded on trucks as they were on the way to POW camps. And one of my father's brothers was on his way to a POW camp. And I, th I thought I was always going to see those trucks of, of, of the uh, surrender of Italian troops to Allied, uh, controlling Allied forces. I thought I'd see my uncle sooner or later on March of Time. I never know if I'd recognize him, but I, he'd be up there sooner or later. So I had that. Was there any agitation from the town? I mean, in some parts of the No, country, because Italians we were, were well, my family, my, my yeah. mother and father were very careful what they said. Uh, and so they had to have the goodwill of this, of their clients, of their customers. Only at night, as I said, we lived above the stores. There's a little building. That, uh, it wasn't so little. Actually, it was a building that had once been the home of a newspaper. The, the uh, Ocean City Ledger had collapsed. There are two papers, but one of them, both weeklies, but one collapsed in 1922. And my father bought the building in 1938. And so there's some of the newspaper uh, ma material, the linotype machines were moved out and he moved his large shop, half of it was my mother's dress shop, half of it was a tailor shop. But upstairs, in our apartment, at night they talked differently than they did today. So I saw in these two characters, this husband and wife, having a voice of different at night than at day. And I thought the complexity of human nature right there and in the store during the day, my father was in the back of the store. He was the tailor, as you know, and altering things as well. But my mother was the front person in the store, and she communicated with a larger America. Yeah. And over the counter, with her regular customers, which were women, usually middle-aged women, and sl slightly overweight women, who didn't go to the beach during summer, and the winter spent their time uh, looking over the frocks on display and carrying on conversations. My mother was an assimilated, somewhat assimilated Amer American, born in Brooklyn uh, in an Italian immigrant family and uh, came to Ocean City when she married my father in 1928. So I was born in 1932. But they were from the same village, right? Oh, yeah, they're, they're all from the same village. Yeah. My dearest cousin, Nick Pileggi, yeah. his mother and my mother were sisters. Wow. And his father and my father were first cousins from Calabria. Yeah. So we're very close. You, you talk about them as characters, Gay. I mean, one of the things about your writing is that the, whatever the subject, you feel that you are dealing, you're creating characters, characters that you find. We're not creating anything. What I'm doing is trying as best I can to befriend people, including people I'm interviewing or I want to interview, because I'm very curious about how different I am from, from them. And that is started in the store when I was wondering about those women, and sometimes hearing from those women stories about their lives, because they were very comfortable with my mother, who knew when not to ask too many questions, but she was as curious as I was. Because she too, uh, while she wasn't foreign, she was born in Brooklyn, which is foreign enough, but, but um, she wanted to know about the larger America, into which she wanted to be accepted. And my role in this little story realm that I'm talking about is, how am I, as a, I always thought I was a half American. I never thought I was fully American. And while I was as careful as they were, when I was in school, what I said, what I did, but I was intensely curious, but not actively so, because I was defensive. And I was an outsider who was defensive. And when I went to work as a copy boy, I was the same curious person wanting to know those people in the big, big store, which was the New York yeah. Times building. And I, I wanted to know people, for, and then I wanted to write about those people who were relatively, I'm not saying they were obscure people, because some of them were, had bylines that was known, Meyer Berger, and people that when I was a copy boy, they were big in the city, had a column in the case of Berger. But they weren't known to the general public, the readership public of the times. So that's why I wanted to write about them, as I wanted to write about the women in my mother's store when I was 15 years younger. Uh, and I was so comfortable with these non-newsworthy people, my mother's customers or the people I met in the city room, because mm -hmm. no one wrote about journalists, I don't think, much more before I did. They write about publishers, they write a biography of Pulitzer, a biography of William Randolph Hearst. 
but not about all the, all the president's men is not well, in, in on anybody's screen at not, that not point that, before not it that. became this yeah. romance. Yeah. I wanted to do that, I, and I wanted to know. Uh, I wanted to write, but I also wanted another thing. I wanted to write well, yeah. and the reason I wanted to write well, I was reading good writers. Now, when I was young, who were you reading? I wasn't reading nonfiction writers because I didn't know any good nonfiction writers. You see, I only read the Wash the uh, the only magazines I read were the Saturday Evening Post because the only magazines you get in Ocean City, New Jersey. Were the Saturday Evening Post and Collier's. You didn't get the New Yorker. No one ever heard of the so New Yorker. So Joe Mitchell is not. I never heard of it. I had never heard of the New Yorker magazine until I came yeah. as a copy boy to right. New York. I only discovered Joe Mitchell then. But yeah. when I'm in my formative years, or as a college student in Alabama, you don't yeah. get the New Yorker either. Um, but but what I got was how to write, or how to read short stories. I started reading short stories seriously as a high school student. Granted, I didn't have much to read in the Saturday Evening Post, but there was sometimes F. Scott Fitzgerald stuff was there. And sometimes um, other good writers who probably got rejected from the New Yorker and it winds up, well, I don't know how I got there. But I liked the short story. And then when I became a copy boy, and someone told me about the New Yorker, and I started subscribing, or no, it was there. It was in the office. You could read it every week. I started reading not only Joe Mitchell, A.J. Liebling, uh, St. Clair McElway, yeah. but I started reading fiction, John O'Hara, Irwin Shaw. Shaw. Yeah. I was my favorite writer, Irwin Shaw. And, and sometimes Carson McCullers was in there, and I'd read these things. And my, my aspiration was to be a short story writer using real names. So I would borrow from, in, this, in the story of book or storytelling style, the fiction writers, the short story writers. I wanted to do that with a magazine piece or, or even with a newspaper feature. And I started to do that in 1956 when I joined, when I, well, even I wrote some stuff as a copy boy, believe me. And I did, on my free time, did some pieces. One was a magazine piece that got in when I was a copy boy. Is that the one about the news? The uh, no, that was the, the the first story I wrote for the New York Times, and it's right you would expect from a boy from provincial Ocean City who was curious. And my copy boy jobs, I told you, I had to sometimes go out and buy sandwiches. And when I was in Times Square, I mean the New York Times building, which was on 43rd Street, but on 42nd Street there was a building that in those days was called the Times Tower. And it used to be where the New York Times was before it outgrew that thing. It was a three-sided building. And what I, and of course, if old pictures you see how famous, it was where the headline, right. the, the bulbs, a thousand bulbs, a million bulbs, are going around, these headlines went around that three-sided building all day and all night. And then I first saw it when I came to New York as a copy boy, and I thought, how the hell do those lights form those letters? So one day when I was, it was lunch hour for me, and I was free to leave the, my building, the main building where my duties were. I wandered over, and I went into the three-sided Times Tower building, and it was empty, and I saw a staircase, and I just walked up to the third floor where I saw a door was open. And I walk in, and I saw a man on the ladder. And the man on the ladder was holding what looked like an accordion, but he was punching numbers in it. And when he came down from the ladder, I said, excuse me, I'm copy boy. Times next. And I wonder, what are you doing? Because I'm putting the headlines up there. How do you do it? So she punched this. I have the headline here, which she got from the foreign editor, the national editor, the city editor, whatever the lead headlines of that day's paper. And I said, Jesus, how, 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 what's your name, sir? Well, my name is uh, James Torpy. Oh, Mr. Torpy, I think what this is interesting. Everybody, anybody ever wrote about you? She said, no. I said, how long have you been doing this? He said, 25 years. This year? 20, <laughs> yes, tw this year, 25 years. This was 1953. I started in uh, uh, 1928 when Al Smith lost to Hoover or something. Right. First headline, God, 25 years. And, how you, you, and he showed me again how you did yeah. I said, oh, well, can I take some notes? And he said, and I went over back to the building, and I, I, there was a wonderful, wonderful reporter, so kind to young people. His name was Meyer Berger. He wrote a column called About New York. And he was, he might think, he treated me as if I was a reporter. I said, Mr. Berger, do you, I saw this, 
if I wrote a, to try to write a story, would you read it before I submitted it? Oh, we'd be glad to. So the next day, I came in with a story I'd written at home. I had a typewriter, and I typed it. And, um, and I showed it to Mr. Berger. Oh, this is fine. Let me see. Let me change a few things. And he did. So I went back, and he said, um, said you can use my typewriter to retype it. He got up, and I'm sitting at Meyer Berger's desk in the front row, yeah. and I'm using his typewriter. And I'm rewriting, I made his corrections, and I had about, it was about a page and a half. Yeah, about a page and a half. And I showed him, he says, that's all right. And she says, go tell it, give it to the Mr. Adams, the city editor is Frank Adams, the man who went to Princeton. But he wasn't very nice, not as nice as Mr. Berger. But he looked at it, says, you wrote this? Yep. Where'd you get the information? I said, it was Mr. James Torphy gave it to me. We'll leave it here. And later on, he called Mr. Torphy. He didn't, but one of his secretaries did. And uh, he said, this is right. And he came back, and he called me up to the city desk, Frank Adams. He said, um, let me keep this for a while. And then about a week later, one of the secretaries, Mr. Adams, came and he said, they, they decided they're going to run that in the editorial page. You won't get your name on it. I said, no. But they'll pay you something. I think I paid 25 bucks. But that was the first piece. But it comes out of just curiosity about something and that leads to meeting James Torpy and he yeah. tells me something. And that was my first piece. And I, I thought I won the Pulitzer Prize when they published <laughs> well, that. Well, you Jeez. would, you would. Apropos the curiosity and the, the establishing relationships with subject, while you're doing the book on the Times, you're also doing the book on the Bonanno family. I mean, on a, it was a little book. later. A little later? I mean, oh, yeah. There was no overlap in the Times? No, there writing? wasn't. I'll tell you, though, both, I, both, I owe both books to the Times. Of course, writing about the Times, I owe, owe to such people as Meyer Berger, who was unfortunately dead then, but all those other people that I knew pretty well and respected enormously. But after a, one of the stories I had before I left the Daily Paper in 1965 was to cover the indictment of the Bonanno family's leader, Joseph Bonanno, who's the boss with the headquarters in Brooklyn. They had about 450 members of their so-called family in Brooklyn. And I was um, covering the um, testimony in federal court of not only the elder Bonanno, but his son, who was also in the mafia. His name is Bill, Bill Bonanno. Right. And um, one day, of course, they said nothing, and their lawyers wouldn't let us talk to them. But one day during a break in the court hearing, I myself left some of the reporters that were uh, gathered around one corner of the corridor in the courthouse. And I went over to Bill Bonanno, and his lawyer, Albert Krieger, was there. And I said, uh, Mr. Bonanno, um, I'm about your age. And my people, my father came from Calabria and your father came from Sicily. I know we're not going to talk. And the lawyer, Albert, said, hey, Mr. Bonanno has no comment. I don't want any comment. I just want to tell you in front of Mr. Bonanno or Bonanno in front of you that someday I'd like to write about this man because our lives are sort of connected. Our fathers are not allied in any way, but our roots are some connected. Yeah, yeah. And I think that Mr. Bonanno, I'm talking third person now, here's Bonanno, a lawyer, I'm talking third. Someday, Mr. Bonanno, if he has an obituary, it'll be written by, from, by reporters who get all the information from the Justice Department or the FBI. And but Mr. Bonanno, who's 30-some years old and has children, I, I read somewhere, those kids will read about him solely from the information that the federal, that the law enforcement provides. And it must be more to his life than that. I said, I don't want a story now, and I don't want to talk to Mr. Bedard now, but someday there might be a time to do it. No comment. I said, yes, Mr. Creek, I heard you say, okay, thank you, nice to hear you, and that's the end, I, I, that's the end of that, I walked away. The next day, I call Albert Krieger's office, and I say, I want to write you a letter. No comment, fine. I write a letter saying, someday I'd like to meet Mr. Bedard. And the next day, or not, or the next week, and a month later, and two years later, I'm still writing to Albert Krieger. 1970, then I quit the New York Times, 65, about two, three months after I wrote, I had the first meeting. 65, 66, 67, 68, 69, I'm still in touch and getting nowhere. Finally in 69, Albert Krieger's office calls me and said, Mr. Bonanno, said that we could ha have dinner uh, off the record just to meet and talk. 
So I did. And he said, we'll meet in Johnny Johnson Steak Joint on 2nd Avenue and 43rd, which is mafia owned. And I met there and the Krieger was with him, Alp Krieger, and I'm with Bill Bonanno. And I said, very nice to meet you. Someday, I hope we'll be free to talk about your life outside the mafia family, because there's more to it. You have a wife. I understand your wife went to a Sacred Heart Commons. I said, mine did too. My wife, Nan, went to Manhattanville, a Sacred Heart Commons. And your children, four of them, are about the same age as my two daughters, who were then six and eight years old. And we have something to talk about. So maybe, he said, now he's talking. But this isn't the time. I said, no, it's not the time. But I'll wait for you to contact me. In 1969, this was about six months after that the first dinner I had, he called me and said, I'm now living in San Jose. I moved from Brooklyn. The Banano family had lost a war. Yeah, yeah. They used to call them in the Banana, Banana Wars. Wars right. Banana War. And so they were exiled, and the father, Joe Banano, who I hadn't talked to, but I would later on, lived in the house in Tucson, which was always his second home. And Bill Bonanno, with his wife and four children, lived in San Jose, San Jose near San Francisco. And I went out there, and he said, you know, I think in two years for sure, I'm going to have to go to jail on a, on a credit card theft. It was a federal violation. He took me later, sort of four years, in, in 1971 and 74, in Terminal Island. And you visited him there. I not only visited him, I stayed with him. I, I, I stayed. In the town, I had a motel, but all day long I'm in his house for a period of about four months, every day, and the bodyguards are around, and the children are around, and the wife was around. And this was really my insight into what would, in a film sense, be the Soprano story. Well, it's not The Godfather. It's, it's not The, the Godfather. It's about the it's, wife it's the and the children more. Life and the difficult because I life, had from, struggling over from, money. from reporter friends of mine who covered crime, including Nick Pileggi, my Dang. cousin, was pretty much an authority on that. Uh, and wrote uh, two screenplays, uh, Good Goodfellas in um, Casino, right. uh, I think, yeah. Yep. Uh, which became movies. But I didn't need to know who shot who. What I wanted to know is how do these mafia guys and their wives, in an era when everything is t taped, wire, wire, wiring and tapping of phones, how do they get through the day and night? How do they conduct their family life? This was the essence of a book called Honor Their Father. Well, you get so many of these folks to talk to you in the code of silence. This is sort of pre-celebrity gangsters. I mean, really, you create that. I mean, but the father writes, writes his book. That came after, father, yeah. After, they, I'm they, saying after well, what you. Did they, how do you get these people to talk? This comes from, I think, anybody who, who's great, I think, one of the most important things about my life as a journalist was I was a child of a store. I think if you have shopkeeper parents, you learn a lot. It's useful in journalism. One is how to treat people with respect, as you must treat your customers. After all, they're providing you with your livelihood. Having Learning about respect and also learning how not to be nosy, but indulge your curiosity. Were you worried at all at any point that in writing this book you were A, putting yourself at risk, and B, putting the people you were writing about at risk? Well, one, uh, I didn't think I thought about that very much. I don't think when you're, when you're in, in, in a, I don't think even when you're in Pearl, you have a sense you are. Yeah. Any more than John Kennedy thought that he was, on that wonderful sunny day, he was going to get shot. I mean, uh, I don't think the Pope thought he was going to shot. With bodyguards and I only had one experience when I, I did feel the closeness of, 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 of danger. Um, when, before he was exiled from Brooklyn, Bill Banana was having a little war, the, the Banana War, which took place in Brooklyn. And one day, I was with him. We often had dinner in Brooklyn, and his bodyguards are all there. And one time, um, I did, I, in the middle of that Banana War was really a war or a fracas between two factions of the Banano family. There had been a group that broke away. Right. They wanted to get Bill Banano, my, my, my subject, thrown out of his number three position. So, and one time, um, I, I, I knew he said, look, we're in some trouble. Maybe you, you should know that I'm being set up, and we know it. About a day after I saw him, I was at home. 
And he never called me up. He just showed up because he didn't want to use the phone. He, of course, had been to my house many times. I had had, incidentally, before I go too far, I one time had Joe Bonanno, the father, and the son both come to dinner with the wife and my wife cooked dinner. <laughs> so we'd had them at our house, the you know, distinguished guests, the Bonanno family. <laughs> And uh, but one day the phone, uh, the, the bell rings at my house, and Bill Banana was there. He usually wore, he was usually carefully dressed, and he, had, he hadn't shaven for days, and his tie was not fitted on. And he said, can I come in for a minute? I said, sure, Bill. He said, listen, I'm in trouble. Uh, what is it? He said, well, I told you about the problem we're having you know, with, our, with our group in Brooklyn. And, they, and I was last night set up to be shot. I was supposed to have a meeting. And there are bullets all over the buildings on a place called Troughton Street in Brooklyn. Yeah. And he said, I want, and, and the cops aren't letting any information out because they want them to give another shot at me. And I want to know if you can get this story about the shooting in the New York Times. I said, wow, it really? He says, you want me to call him? Yeah. Why won't? Because if you get something in the paper, uh, it'll, be hard it, it'll be hard for them. The cops will have to, have to acknowledge what's going on because they're in on the take with this other group. Yeah. I called up the editor, uh, my, uh, Arthur Gelb, I, he's my boss, and Abe Rosenthal was my big boss. I called Arthur, I said, listen, Arthur, I don't know who's covering Brooklyn today, but there was a shooting last night, and there are bullets all over these buildings in Troutman Street, and the cops aren't doing anything, and no one knows about this. And Arthur Gelb said, how do you know about it? I said, I have a very good source. Take my word for it. The guy was right there. The, 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 the gangster was right, right there. The bodyguard's outside the house. Yeah. And he said, well, we'll check it out. I said, OK, you check it out. And if you want any more information, call me back. And he called me back. He says, he made some phone calls to Gelb himself. So they got a reporter on it. Next there's a big story about this. And my, my gangster friend was, was very in, indebted to me. And um, so that's how that story got in. Yeah. But, but, but also, uh, that's enough, like, that's yeah, all. But, but you decided to set up college trust funds. For oh, this kids. is later. What, when led, I, what led to that? Well, what leads to that is, as a reporter, any ethical reporter doesn't have to be told this. You never pay your sources. Well, that's why I'm asking. Never, never, never. And I never did and never will. But when you make a lot of money from a movie, I didn't know I was going to, but... Uh, uh, when you do that, you might be asked by the movie company to get releases because they use real names, as I use real names. Well, you can use real names in a book, but if you have a film, the film company wants additional, uh, they have a contract of their own with the people whose stories they're buying from your book. And when I had, when I had honor thy father, my, uh, my agent said, we have a, uh, was, she's dead now, her name, Canna Donatio. She was Philip Roth's agent. Yeah. She was Mario Puzo's agent. And when I had a movie offer from uh, CBS to do a two-part, uh, she says, there's a lot of money here. And I said, well, what I'd like to do, uh, our lawyer was Paul Gitlin, who sure. was her uh, the agent's lawyer as well. I'd like to set up a college trust fund with Paul Gitlin being the trustee to give enough money, if we make enough money, to put these four kids in college to tuition, only that. Because I think if they're educated, they don't have to be involved with mafia money as their father was because of his father and people other than that. And that was my way of, of cooperating without getting tainted by any way. And the second time I did that was when I made a, a book when I dealt with it, but thy neighbor's wife. Mm. And in that case, it wasn't anything I needed, but the book, the, the company that bought the movie, United Artists, wanted to use the names of two principal characters, which are married couple, adulterous the married Williams. couples. And they made, um, for the signature, for the use of the names, the United Artists paid $50,000 to each of those two couples, 50 to one, 50 to the other couple. That's about it. You, you raised the question of thy neighbor's wife or the subject. The first two books, the Times book and the Banana book, big successes, bestsellers. You're the you're one, you're prince of the city. I mean, you're the guy, and you're about to be the president of Penn. All of the oh, not for long. Well, all of the 
Well, the, the, that, that book was considered a scandalous and dirty book. Um, and well, I guess in a way it was. Let me ask about the genesis of it. And it's 1971. You tell the story that you're having dinner with Nan at Clark's. You're walking back home. You, you're at Lexington and yeah. whatever. It was 1972. You see the too. sign that says live nude models. And then it all goes from there. I mean, Well, what goes from there? I, I, I told happens? you I had Honor Thy Father published in 1971. 1972, it's true, we were coming back from P.J. Clark's, walking up Lexington Avenue and about, I think it was 57th Street on the, on the um, west side of Lexington, there was a sign from the third floor of a brick building, say live nude models, and I said to Nan, God, let's go up and check that out. It's about 11 o'clock, 10.30. Said, no, no, I'm not going up there, come on. No, no, I'll go, you co I'll go home. So I went up these third floor steps of this building and I was walking into what I later was told was this massage parlor. I didn't even know what that meant then. And the men who were, who were behind, the young men behind the desk, uh, so we're closing, sorry, it was about 11 o'clock. Oh, well, I saw the sign, yes, that's true. Are there live nude models here? Come back tomorrow. Yes, yes but yes, there are. They are masseuses. Oh, and they're also photo models, because in those days, having Taking pictures of, of nude women was was part of the of, of of the it was like one of the perks of going to massage parlors. You get to take pictures, but you're mostly for a massage. So the next morning, they open at eleven o'clock. I'm back at the same place. A different manager, young young also a young man, showed me on the desk were were, were photo albums of pictures of young women. Number one, number two, number three, number four. And there were four masseuses on duty, and there were four massage rooms back there, beyond the, the manager's desk. And he said it cost thirty dollars. I said for what? To get a massage? Oh, okay. So I gave him thirty dollars, and I, which masseuse? You know, I said, take number number three here, June. They have their first name under there. So I go back, and the woman looks at me. First thing she asks is, you want oil or powder? Oil or powder? Oh, do you have showers here? I said, no. I said, I'll take powder. Said, okay. <laughs> so take your clothes off. I said, take your clothes off. Take yeah, then just lie down. So I took my clothes off. There's a couple hangers there. And I took my clothes off, and then she took her top off. Not her little uh, shorts, but her top off. She says, just lie down. And then I said, where are you from? Uh, Birmingham. Birmingham, Alabama? Yes. I went to that. school, University of Tuscaloosa. I said, how long have you been here? I just came here. He says, what are you doing? I'm going to school. Where? Hunter. <laughs> going to school, Hunter? It was nearby. It was at 67th yeah. Street. And, and, and you do this, this is your wife. He says, I paid my way through Hunter. Wow. I said, you make a lot? Oh, yes, you make a lot of money. And I have eight or nine customers or more a day, half hour, only half hour customer. And then she said, well, what would you like? I said, what do you give? She said, I give locals. What are locals? <laughs> she says, we'll give you a hand job. I said, is that included in the $30? Yes, it's included. <laughs> hey. Wow. I said, well, okay. So she gave me a hand job. And I said, wow. I said, how long do you do this? She says, I only told you I've been here only a couple of months. And then what? I have to go to school. I have to go to Hunter later. <laughs> so I thought this is interesting because here's a woman who I was then in my, I guess it was in my 40s. I can't remember what, how old it was. I was born in 32. This is 72. What am I, 40? 40. 40. And she's about 21 or 19 or 20. And I thought, what a difference in our ages. Uh, I mean, our generation. I mean, I grew up a Catholic kid in a parochial school when I was at Ocean City. And of course, I was not in a parochial school when I went to Alabama. I was in, among a lot of Protestants. Uh, as I was when I was a boy in my hometown. But this whole generation, this is the era, 1972, when we had Playboy was <coughs> pretty advanced in, in his photography then. Uh, pubic hair was then, I think, being shown in Playboy. I'm not sure about that. I know it was shown in Penthouse. And this is a young woman who's a college student, so different from the college students that I knew when I was at Alabama. And how easily she was making the transition from being a student herself. 
and picking up easy money, doing lo giving locals to pol polukas like me. Uh, and I thought, there are also three other women doing this in this place, close to my home. The next day I went back and I met another college student who was from NYU. And she was getting Glad a Glad CUNY doesn't have degree. a monopoly on this. And I, I thought, I thought what I'm going to try to do is get them to tell me their story because they represent this generation, either called flower children or sometimes they were politically active and against the war in Vietnam, smoking dope or smoking marijuana. And they're this different culture. And I thought if I can get a story on the record, a, a real person telling me about her upbringing and she comes to New York, not to be a copy boy journalist like me, but comes to get an education in one of the city universities, I would get from her, her, mental, her mental attitude about job, proper jobs, proper employment, in her case, massage parlor, and yet looking to a better life through education, to whatever she's going to come, maybe an actress or maybe one want to be a psychologist. And if I got a man, a customer like me, to represent me, my generation, you know, guys that were, who, who thought carrying a Playboy around was, was something you should put a play, paper bag over and never be seen carrying that around. The, the kind of restrictions upon the freedom of expression that I grew up with and how different was this generation represented by age, the age group of these masseuses. But this That's what I tried to do. This becomes participant observer in a pretty quick order. You're managing your temporary oh, that comes manager. Later. Later, no, no, what I did parts. later, no, later, I, I went to this man who ran the business. I suppose if I didn't become a customer only, I've been a customer a number of times, why can't I sit in your job, and fill in for you, and you won't have to pay me, but I just want to run a place. I can do it. And he says, he knew, he says, you're the guy that wrote that a book on it. Yeah, because that was out in 71, a year before this. I do it. I said, I want to keep hours. And um, I know how to do it. Because I had store training for guys. I mean, I knew how sure. to run a business. <laughs> and so. Uh, Amortize all that time. And so I started OGC. doing it. And then when I got the girls to do, I would pay them for their hours. I wanted them to write their stories and also their experiences in, with customers, what the customers said, what they did, blah, blah, blah. And I found one student, one uh, masseuse, when I first saw her walk in the massage bar, she was carrying Walker Percy's novel, The Movie Goer. Sure. And I, she liked, sure. she's, a, she's a literary student, a literary student. Liter and I liked that. And, I, and she wrote wonderfully about that. And so I had these, they were like my reporters. They were like my sources. They were my leg men, as you can, they, these women were. And I was collecting their stories. But then the woman who, was, who read The Movie Goer did the best work. And then after I'd paid her for everything she wrote and also had a release to use her name, she went back on her word. I'm sorry, I can't, I can't give you my name. I said, oh, you promised. No, I'm sorry, I can't do it. And if she wouldn't do it, I said, I, I, I have to have that name. Why have you always insisted on the name? And Tell you why. I believe, I don't think all journalists characters. agree about No, I wanted to have real names, because that's what I wanted to do as a writer. Now I wanted to write books. But yeah. when I started as a short story writer, I believe that journalists have to be accountable. Now I know that when you're dealing in politics, like you're covering the White House and, or covering foreign affairs, whatever, I never did either. But I believe that I was going to make, I believe that, I believed in nonfiction. And I believe that it shouldn't be easy to write good nonfiction, because it isn't. Especially when you have to develop yeah. both the trust with the people you're writing about without them uh, uh, compromising you as an outsider, as a journalist, which a, a journalist has to have the outsider mentality. You're never part of the group you're writing about any more than I was part of the mafia or the, or the pornographers that I wrote about in Die Neighbors. Right? But, uh, or the masseuses. But um, I, wa I insisted that I get their names because I believe it. It, it strengthens your relationship with the reader. If the reader knows that you aren't making it up, 
because I believe the distinction between fiction and nonfiction should be so clear. And as I'm doing this, there are certain distinguished writers of fiction. Uh, um, I don't want to mention names, but a lot of them were writing using real names but making up stories around them. Well, been, ragtime. Let's take sure. our friend Doctor, who was a great writer. Yeah. But I didn't like ragtime because he had Henry Ford in there and he had other real people. And it was mixed up with, with novel. And I thought, no, you can't get away with that. You shouldn't get away with that. You either write fiction and, and create the characters, like, like Herman Wilk created a character, Captain Queek, a well-known character. Or Marjorie Morningstar was fiction. Yeah. But we know that this is a fiction writer, whether you're Joyce Carol Oates or, or, or William Styron. But they sometimes, they were making, I didn't know to what degree their research into the character, using Henry Ford, for example. Uh, I just didn't like that. Is that why you introduce yourself by name in the third person? Well, I did, I did that in Thy Neighbor's Wife. I did have to tell the reader, how did I get this information? So if the, what I told you today, tonight, I put in, in the afterword of Thy Neighbor's Wife uh, because I believed, and I did it in third person, because I also had a sense of detachment for myself, meaning I, as a journalist, sometimes write about myself, as I did in Thy Neighbor's Wife, because I thought it was necessary. Otherwise, how could I get this information if I wasn't in a, in a, in a sexual situation yeah. such as Sandstone, which is, I haven't explained what it is, but I had to tell the reader where this information comes from and how come I got it. Well, at the end of it, you're standing, you're at a nudist camp in New Jersey, right? Yeah, it happened and there. And you're standing there. Nude, I was nude, in a nudist camp. Looking at a boat, looking at you, and it becomes this kind of meditation on voyeurism. Well, I mean, my hometown, there was a, by the sea, I told you engaged. earlier, there's an Ocean City Yacht Club, and they used to go up the, the Egg Harbor River, which is, and then to this nudist camp was on the river. And these people on these boats, which were, anchored within a mile or less of the, of the nudist park, that these binoculars, they're all on deck looking at these people. And I'm on deck in the nude with these other nudists that I'm writing about that's in the book. And they're looking at me, the native son from Ocean City, New Jersey, the, 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 the writer in residence of, of these swinging, of the nudist camp. And, um, and I thought, how interesting. I'm the observer, or think I am, but I'm the object of these observers on these, on these anchored yachts and motorboats and their binoculars on me and, yeah. and I'm sort of looking at them and the, this odd relationship between a reporter and his, and his observers while the reporter becomes the object of their well, interest. It, it's really the, the interest, one of the interesting things about the book. I mean, it is a meditation on the shift from 50 sexual mores to 70s, a remarkable registry of the zeitgeist of, of the moment. That's not what gets talked about when the book appears. It all becomes about to well, the difficulty a was Plimpton, right? The b difficulty was that I was married and remained married. And w worse than that, for me personally, was that my daughters were, in 1972, not yet teenagers. They were, one was born in 1967, the other was born in 1964. So they were in these schools. Yeah. And the parents of the students that they're going to school with are talking about this disgraceful father that they had. And there's a lot of stories in the newspapers also well, about me. Well, there was me. that piece in New York, the Lathan piece. What is it? The that was 72. That was in New York Magazine. Uh, and that was just horrible. Night in the, mood with, in, in the Nude. The Night Gay in the Nude with Gay Tilly. So this guy that, and I was up for President of Penn then. Yeah. The, the President of Penn was uh, Jerzy Kaczynski and people like Kurt Vonnegut who, who liked me and, and a number of people. Uh, wanted me to be the next president. And I became the subject on the slate for, for the presidency. But when that piece came out, which was before the book, incidentally, um, that you mentioned, the piece by Aaron Latham, uh, we had strong feminists on the board of Penn. And people actually, though they're writers, they didn't, they wanted to, um, uh, protest against pornography, protest against uh, 
magazines like, like or, uh, Screw Magazine by Al Goldstein, Goldstein and thing, yeah. people that I kind of thought of as part of the f First Amendment protections we should have. Al Goldstein or or the guy that was the the star of Deep Throat. I, I, Harry I, Reams. Harry Reams. I, I defended them once. I try to regard these people, these pornographers or actors in X-rated films and anyone as part of freedom of expression. I mean, the fact that Updike and Norman Mailer and, the, and other literary writers, Roth. Philip Roth, could use this language and write these stories, especially Roth. Yeah. And yet it came not from Bennett Cerf or Albert, Alfred Knopf or Simon and Schuster's brothers. Or, yeah. It came from the pornographers. Yeah. The real hero of First Amendment in my book, and I wrote about well, it, of course, the, Samuel Ru Roth. Ru people never Roth heard of and Rudin. I mean, all of those. All of those people yeah. gave to Knopf and, and yeah. all the writers, if you want to, to write the language you could use. You could use F-U-C-K. Mailer couldn't in, in, uh, no, in his first fun. novel. Yeah. Uh, Make it in the dead. Make it in the dead. But all this, you say, well, is it necessary? Who cares? But writers have, writers have the option of doing yeah. what they want to do. Thanks to the slime publisher of uh, peddlers like Philip Roth, I mean, um, Samuel Roth. Roth. Oh, Philip Roth, I mean, uh. Uh, Samuel Roth. There's this famous case, yeah. Roth versus US. Any reporter should read that case. Yeah. Always so, just called Roth. And, and Roth went to jail for a third of his life. For what? For selling smut, which became, at what time, one time, smut was was Ulysses, and later on it was Lady Chatterley's lover, and you know we define smut differently from year to year, or generation to generation. This is maybe off the subject, so let's not get yeah, off. Yeah, let me shift. Let's get on shift something because else. I'm a little worried about the time. We could talk forever, but following up, you go and you write this book about your family's history under the sun's remarkable history of that. In one of the reissues of the sort of joint reissue of Honor, uh, Thy Father and Thy Neighbor's Wife, you talk about the Bonanno story as being about the, the enduring power of the past on the present or the weight that the past exercises on the present. What's at stake for you in thinking about the past and history and your own life? I mean, it is a, you know, it's, it's a remarkable narrative of, of your family's history. Seems in a way rather a light motif in your work that the sense of the past well, and of history. It's 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 being a reporter, uh, in a way, of intimacy. I mean, it, for me, it was gradually moving from Thy Neighbor's Wife, where I revealed myself and my research methods, taking my clothes off, hanging out with swingers in Sandstone Retreat, yeah. which is in California, yeah. or or massage parlors before that. Then in the next step, I wanted to write about the Italians. Um, and I was going to write about Lee Iacocca. And then I had, I didn't want to write about Lee Iacocca. I wanted to be more intimate. So I wanted to write about, write about my father. But about a year or so, I was so defensive. I remember I told you I was defensive as a boy. Yeah. I was defensive also, probably because of the, ac the, the negative effect that thy neighbor's wife had upon my personal life, and especially on my young daughters. Not my wife, my wife is strong, and she took it and never, never revealed any discomfort in being with me. I, I didn't, the pen people, these freedom, wonderful pen writers, they, they turned on me and I had to drop out for, I, I did myself, I withdrew from, the, from aspiring to be the president of pen. Uh, but what I didn't withdraw from was, was feeling I had to kind of maybe myself um, find a way not to be labeled forever as the dirty writer of Thy Neighbors. I'm sure Philip Roth felt some of this with Portnoy. I didn't talk to Roth about this, but I read a little bit about it. So what I thought is I'll write about the automobile business. That's, that'll clean, that'll show people I'm not just a dirty writer. And I picked Iacocca because this is an Italian I can write about his background. It's probably some of, some of it's like my own, as, as was Bill Bananos before yeah. his. But then it got to be, he was saying things, and I had so much access. He, some things, sometimes, uh, 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 Dr. Kelly, you get too much access. It's bad enough when you don't get enough access, but it's worse when you get too much access in a way. Because I got to know too much, and I know that I didn't want 
be, be disrespectful to an altogether good guy, but he was a hustler for cars. I Coke, I'm talking about. He's a real huckster, terrific guy, but a huckster. And, um, and I also had a problem with a friend of mine named David Halberstam. The Reckoning. He was right, he wrote The Reckoning, but he had a problem with me, or I had a problem with him, sometimes too ambitious, two, two wonderful friends, but ambitious. So he got on, on the story after I'd started with Iacocca. And I didn't want to back out because Halberstam wanted to take Iacocca. I, was, I don't think it was honorable. We had a feud which went on for 10 years. So, but I didn't want to do Iacocca. But I didn't know how to get out of it because Halberstam wanted it. And I didn't want to let him knock me off. I was just some crazy, yeah. craziness. Well, he wanted you to give him access to Iacocca, right? Well, he, no, he could get his access to Iacocca. Yeah. But I, I, I thought it was, it was really, a, it was really unbrotherly of, of him, because we were like brothers, closer. I, Nick Pelleggi was my closest friend, but Halberstam, in a way, was even closer, because I had more access to Halberstam. He was still, Nick was married to Nora Ephron then, and I couldn't see him without her permission. It was a lot of problems. <laughs> I, and so I like Halberstam was available. And when I saw Nick, it had to be with Nora and my wife. So there's a different situation developed with Nick and me because of the marriage to Nora. But with Halberstam, when he came on to want some of what I was doing, I thought, this is, uh, this is unpardonable. This cannot go on. So I broke up with him. And then I later on you know, broke up with Iacocca because somebody wanted to write an As Told To book, and that got me an out. So I, I'm going to write about my father, and I wrote about myself. And I write about Ocean City and how I became a reporter. So I became a reporter on my mother and father, on me, to, to, to the degree that I was able to write about my upbringing in the store. And after that, I went on to write about how I write, and after that, where I am now, I want to write about my marriage. So there's three books mm -hmm. are into intimacy, but reporting. Mm -hmm. Now, when it comes to my wife... How do you write a book, given your technique about your, your marriage? Well, I'm doing, what I'm doing is I realized that I, could, I didn't want to interview Nan, but I, wanted, I have access to material, our, our letters. Mm -hmm. my, I wrote about my wife, never published it, all the time I married her. Every year, I, sometimes when I'd have a quarrel and Nan would write me a terrible letter and she's leaving tomorrow, I'd write what caused the quarrel and what I wrote back to her or how we resolved the problem. But I kept, unknown to her, a written record of every complaint she wrote to me. <laughs> so I have a history of complaints. You're talking about Portnoy's complaint. I have Gates Elisa's complaint. <laughs> and I did that. But then it came to interviewing Nan, and I thought, I, I have to get another voice in here. So a friend of mine, a young friend of mine, is named Katie Royfe, and she wrote a book I adored called Uncommon Arrangements about she marriages. a great interview with you in the Paris That Review. was later. That yeah. was later. Oh, yes, she did. That's right. Uh, and I trust her, and she likes Nan, but she's not beholden to Nan. Uh, her mother, incidentally, Anne Royfe, has published books with Nan, and still does. But Katie knows us as a family, knows Nan, and I know that Katie is enough of a, of, a, of, a, of a writer and reporter and can't be bought off by Nan or me and get her to get on uh, transcript Nan's story, which will be untouched by me. So whatever Nan says and has already talked to Katie and will continue, it'll be an insert uh, that is that's not controlled by me, and Nan will say whatever she wants. Uh, well, that's in the offing. Yeah. Where La are we? Last question. Okay. Um, what drove you? What drove? What drew you back to doing portraits, profiles for the New Yorker? Uh, we've been pleasured to see these appear in the last. Well, I, I always loved the short story I told you, and and also what happened. My, I used to write a lot for Esquire. But my editor died, his name is Harold Hayes. A legend. A great editor. And I didn't have an editor connection there. And I pitched a few under the new editor, uh, what do you, um, the new editor. I pitched a couple of ideas because I wanted to, I wanted to write about people that I wrote about for, before. One of them, I, I approached Esquire, I must have been three years ago, I don't know when it was, but when Peter O'Toole, 
I wrote about Peter O'Toole, the biggest and star. And he was the biggest, right? one of the biggest movie stars yeah. in the 1960s. Yeah. He'd done Lawrence of Arabia, and I went out to London I, during a newspaper strike, which allowed me to travel, and this was 63. I went to London and did this profile, and I kept in touch with him. Parenthetically, let me say that I keep in touch with almost everybody I write about, because I write about them sometimes later. You mentioned Honor Thy Father. Yeah. I went back and did a revisit to that family a year before Bill Bonanno died, in fact, I, I write about his funeral in yeah. the, in the uh, Harper's, yeah. Harper, Harper and Row edition of yeah. Honor Thy Father. Yeah. And I wrote about, uh, I wrote a book on the bridge, which is, which is a complete six book. I'm going That's back and I'm doing yeah. another book in 2000, um, 2014, which is the 50th anniversary. So I'm coming out with Walker and Company, which is Bloomsbury, I guess you call it. Another book on that, and I've looked up and kept in touch with old iron workers. They're as old or 80 like I am, or yeah, 75. Whoever's alive, I've revisited yeah. writing about again. So I, know, I, feel, I feel the story, I know the story never ends. No story is, just because we publish it, it's still on. Yeah. It still goes. And, you, and if they're alive, people you wrote about 30, 40, you're 50, you can go back and see what happened to them since, yeah. and what's happened to you. And there's always an ongoing, in nonfiction, the story never ends. And so, in um, the case, what you talk about? I forgot. <laughs> this is what happens when you get to be old. I was talking about the decision to return to doing portraits and profiles. Oh, yes. I was saying that they wouldn't let, uh, Esquire's editor said, we don't want you to write about Peter O'Toole. No they didn't want the Chinese uh, they soccer didn't want player either, which is a great story. Nobody wanted that. Even the New Yorker didn't want that. Uh, I pitched a lot of stuff. Sometimes I go to classes of journalism. Oh, you could, oh, you know, um, you can get to do anything you want. It's crazy. I get turned down all the time. I get rejected, as any young person or old person knows. If you're, if you're a writer, who has to send in submissions or 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 summaries of of ideas. But I liked um, what I liked the New Yorker as it is now. I wouldn't have said as much when Sean was the editor, yeah. or even Gottlieb was the editor, because I didn't know Bob Gottlieb. And nobody from the New Yorker asked me to write for them, except the new guy, David Remnick, whose work I so admired. And when he became the editor of the New Yorker, he let me know that he'd be interested in me writing for him. So why I am working for the New Yorker, first of all, is they'll have me. <laughs> That's the big thing. And secondly, is I respect so much what he does, Remnick. I mean, he's like the best writer they have, and he's the best editor they have. And a boxing so, fan. And, and a bo boxing fan. We have a lot in common. Not that he won't turn down pieces by me easily, but I'm really saying that's why I, because I like magazine writing, and when you do books that take 10 years or, or more, uh, and, and you're out of print so long, that you're, you don't get any, satisfaction of being in print for the period, it could be a decade or more. And mag when I was doing magazine work in the old days, when Esquire was print printing, publishing me, I enjoyed it because it led, my book in the New York Times was started by writing about Times people for Esquire, the, 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 the guy who was the first Mr. Get Bad News, the obituary writer. Damn. And the article on Clifton Daniel came to be, it was in that's my first chapter. And the Bonanno story excerpted a lot of that in, in Esquire. Thy Neighbor's Wife, I, my first chapter was written as a magazine piece. And so writing, if you can get editors of magazines to subsidize your, the cost of your research, mm -hmm. which is always helpful because sometimes your advances from publishers are not very large and doesn't support the traveling and the bi dining and whining of the subjects. You know, I, I, I do buy their dinner. I don't give them money, but I do, I do um, act as their host on many, many, many occasions. But um, I miss that. So when I was able to go back and do a piece on the bridge for, for David Remnick, the first piece I had was I don't know, seven or eight, six years ago, I forget. And then later on, uh, I was able to write about an opera singer I wanted to write about, somebody piece. I happened to know, some Russian. And I went to Moscow for the first time and she showed me, this is great fun. Do you have someone you're writing about? And you go to their town. I had never been to Moscow. And then after that, 
this is easy, sorry, Tony, Tony Bennett, well, easy to write about Tony Bennett. And Lady Gaga, I met her and wrote about, that's fun. And it wasn't hard. And the Girardi piece, too. Girardi, that was hard because he's so, he was so, I don't want to use it, he's pretty boring. Yeah. Oh my God, he was so, I liked him, I admire him. Yeah. But it was so hard to and make him interesting because he wasn't Casey Stengel, it wasn't, it wasn't a char colorful character, yeah. but Girardi was very guarded. Yeah. And so I had to find, I opened the piece writing about him when he was a 10 year old as a, as in St. Louis, he comes from Illinois, St. Louis Cardinal fan and he's 10 years old and he caught a, somebody from some Montreal left fielder threw him a baseball, this kid's 10 year old. And he dropped the baseball and the guy comes over and the outfielder gives them a ball, hands it to him. He says, son, if you want a, I want a ball, you have to learn how to catch it. Well, this kid becomes a catcher, Joe Girardi. Yeah. And I looked, it took me a month to look up that ball player who played for the Montreal <laughs> Expos, and that became the lead. But that kind of research is part of being a, a persistent journalist. A, 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 you know, we have one that knows what I'm talking about. We have one of the great writers of nonfiction in this room right now, and who knows about perseverance, the great Mr. Carroll, who I'm delighted is with me tonight, and you and with you tonight. But this is a subject that any journalism student probably knows. Persistence, perseverance, and patience is necessary. Qualities that you've demonstrated in space. Mr. Talese has agreed to sign some books outside. Uh, please join me in thanking him for this remarkable conversation. Thank you.